All right, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians tonight. So if you want to turn there to chapter 1, we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. I may, I may or may not do a study on 1 Corinthians in the weeks to, ahead, but we'll just see how it goes. I kind of like to leave the options open. That song, Fill Me Now, that ought to be the desire of every Christian, but I think a lot of Christians are confused about how God answers that prayer. And uh, one very simple thing, you can't fill anything that is full of something else. And so just common sense says that uh, before the filling can take place, the emptying has to take place. And that is something that most of us, if not all of us, do not want to do. Our old nature doesn't want to do it, our, and uh, the world doesn't want you to do it, and the devil doesn't want you to do it. So it um, is going to take some real um, determination on the part of a child of God to mean business with that song. What I want to do tonight is I want to just uh, kind of uh, introduce, introduce you or um, give you kind of an overview of this book. And um, so if you've got a piece of paper handy, why you can write on that or just write on a check and sign it and <laughs> put it in the offering, we'll do the rest. It doesn't make any difference. Um, and then I, then I think next, uh, Lord willing, next week I'll deal with uh, the first chapter. But tonight we're just going to do an overview of this book. So let's have a word of prayer and uh, we'll see uh, what we can learn tonight. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your love and your mercy in our lives. And, and uh, we just uh, thank you for your goodness uh, it's beyond uh, our understanding and our comprehension, but we thank you for it because uh, you are a merciful and a gracious and a good God, and I thank you for that. Thank you for the Bible. I uh, thank you it's been preserved for us and help us to understand it that we might understand you and how you work and we might understand the church and how the church uh, uh, ought to behave and some of the problems that uh, exist in it and uh, how they need to be dealt with. I pray tonight that um, you'll have your way in this meeting. Thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, here in, uh, in verse 1, uh, <clears throat> Paul is called to be uh, an apostle. And in verse 2, this letter is unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. And um, he, um, he is the author of the book, verse 1, which uh, he uses in all of his writings to introduce himself at the very beginning. And uh, this book was written from uh, the city of Ephesus. While Paul was in Ephesus, he wrote to the Corinthians. And certainly he wrote in response to the rumors that he was hearing uh, the news that he was hearing about this church, and we'll, we'll, we'll see some of those in just a moment. Uh, probably written in about 57 A.D., and um, when, uh, when Paul went to this city, the population was about 400,000 people. It was a prominent uh, center of commerce, and uh, there were all kinds of examples of immorality there, the temple of Venus was there with uh, their hundred priestesses. Really, they were dedicated to prostitution in the name of religion. It was not uncommon for religion, religions to have male and female prostitutes in order to attract uh, converts to their religion. And you see that all through the Old Testament. And I've been to India where the um, where the temples have been closed down because that is uh, what they were until they outlawed that in India. Uh, there are other uh, countries that still practice the religious prostitution. The city uh, was not too far from Athens, and of course Athens had its own problems, uh, more with intellectualism 
And uh, in this letter, uh, in this environment, uh, Paul went there and started a church. And uh, it's amazing to me that a church would exist and could exist at all in, uh, in such a city. And Paul established this church at Corinth on his uh, second missionary journey. I want you to go to Acts 18 with me. Keep your place in 1 Corinthians. And uh, if you look at chapter, uh, chapter 18, we won't, we won't take time because the, most of the uh, uh, chapter deals with that. But uh, in chapter 18, verse 1, it says, After these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. And, of course, there he found uh, some believers, and uh, they were tent makers, according to the last part of verse 3. In verse 4 it says, And he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And it uh, goes on down to talk about people getting saved. And if you look down in verse 9, Then, Paul, then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, and he said, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set upon thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. In verse 11, And Paul continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So uh, Paul started that church at Corinth. And uh, you read that 18th chapter, and you'll see the background and some of the things surrounding it. In the house of uh, justice, uh, he stayed there as a year and six months, according to verse 7 through 11. And um, so when you read this letter, you're amazed at all of the problems this local church had. And I know folks, you know, uh, I don't know, I guess uh, whenever you've got people, you're going to have uh, some kind of problems. But... Um, uh, this church has more. This church at Corinth has more problems than any church I've ever heard of, and I just uh, no wonder the pastor isn't mentioned. He probably took a vacation, never came back, because when you begin to look at the things, because when you begin to read uh, in uh, chapter uh, one, verse uh, four, if you look at uh, chapter one, verse four. He said, and I thank God always in your behalf. Uh, let me go on down. Um, <clears throat> down about verse 10, there was a problem of division in that church. And uh, it certainly was, a, was an immoral a setting. Um, but um, one of the problems was they were puffed up with wisdom. If you look down in verse... Uh, Verse 4, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to, to you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and all knowledge. And um, in verse 7, of course, they are fighting over gifts later on in the book, as we'll see, so that you, became, you came behind in no gift and um, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then in verse 10, he says, I beseech you by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same things and that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So uh, it appears then from, the, as you begin to read this book, that they're affected by immoral, uh, the immoral environment uh, at Corinth. And uh, pride causes division within the church, and it disrupted the services. If you, uh, if you look at verse 11, he says that there, it has been declared to me that there are divisions or contentions among you, and the contentions were over personalities. Look at verse 12. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. This church was divided at least in four ways over personalities. So within that church, you had one group says, well, we follow the Apostle Paul. He was a dispensationalist. And then we have those that say, well, we follow Simon Peter. We like his fire and zeal. Whether, 
We don't worry about whether it's true or not. He just keeps us worked up. And then there's Apollos. Apollos was noted for his uh, ability to speak and his wisdom. Then there was a group that said, I'm of Christ. So in this church, uh, uh, they were divided in four ways. Notice that two-thirds of them were not followers of Paul, and yet he founded the church. Some of them said, I'm of Paul. Others said, I'm of Apollos. Others said, I'm of Cephas. Others said, I'm of Christ. So there was a major division within the church. And I've seen that kind of thing happen over the years. You know, somebody gets a, a TV or a radio pastor, and that pastor has more, uh, more attention uh, from the member than his own local church. And pretty soon, uh, his church and his pastor is no longer his church and pastor. He just shows up because he's got a TV pastor. And, of course, uh, he doesn't have to be accountable to him. And or somebody just orders tapes and sits home and watches tapes or listens to tapes. And that kind of thing goes on. Or somebody says, I've got my radio pastor. And, uh, and so, you know, the Lord doesn't want that kind of uh, divided loyalties. It's okay to have a radio pastor, television pastor, or ministry you listen to, but you have to realize that if you're a member of a church, that your allegiance and ministry ought to be through that church. Does that make sense to you? It doesn't take anything away from you. But when you do those things and you take it away from the local church, then uh, you don't make yourself responsible to, for anything or anybody. You're no longer responsible for the rest of the body of Christ. You're not responsible to use your gifts that God has given you. And, um, you know, a lot of people are sending their tithe and offering to some TV. You know, as some guy on television yesterday, I mean, I listened to him 30 seconds and I knew he was a charlatan, you know. And, uh, you know, you, you've been around this thing as long as I have. You can almost smell them, you know. And uh, you've got to watch, uh, especially, especially television preachers. Some of them are good. Some of them are good. But uh, most of them are not. And uh, you can tell by how much they ask for money. That's part of it. How many times they want you to send money to them. And when they start offering you healing and all these kind of things, if you'll send an offering, you know, I, I, I agree with what one fellow said, you know, he said, uh, um, he says, you send me five bucks, I'll send you an anointed Band-Aid. He said, I don't know if it'll heal you or not, but I need the five bucks. <laughs> well, at least he's honest, you know. Hey, you know, more Sorello. How many of you ever heard that guy? Well, you ought to quit listening to him, you know. Uh, he is, uh, that guy's about as, as four fruity and four out left field as you can get, you know. And, uh, and uh, you know, I mean, there's just a, there's a group out there that uh, they're just not leveling with you. And uh, I put Kenneth Copeland in there and uh, Morris Sorello and uh, Benny Hinn. And um, help me out. I don't know anything about him. Shambach. Who? Shambach. Shambach. Yeah, yeah, he's a Shambach. All right. <laughs> so anyway, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I just, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've done a lot of reading and research on these guys. Uh, Earl Roberts. I mean, anybody that tells you that God told him that if I don't raise a million dollars, if you don't raise a million dollars, I'm going to kill you, you ought to let the guy die. Really. I mean, I can't even imagine, I can't imagine the audacity to go before people and say things like that. You know, I saw a 900-foot Jesus. Well, you were smoking something. <laughs> Really, I mean, that's just, that's insanity. But you know, people are insane. And maybe that's the crowd they're appealing to. It must be. You know, it's not just those preachers that are insane. Everybody that sends them money is insane. And uh, so, uh, you know, you need, to, uh, you need to realize that, now these men here in verse 12 are good men. Uh, Paul is a good man. He's God's man. Apollos is a good man. He's a, he's a wonderful person. Peter, Cephas, why, there's nothing wrong with him. 
and then of Christ. There's nothing wrong with that. But what happens is, uh, you know, people begin to play each other, these leaders against each other, and, and they're appalled at this. They're opposed to you dividing the body of Christ over personalities. Uh, they care more about the church than they do, you know, uh, getting a little following. He said in verse 13, is Christ divided? Of course he's not. Well, neither should the church be. Was Paul crucified for you? Of course not. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. So he's saying right there, he said, I don't want you, you know, dividing the body of Christ over me or anybody else. So you see all that kind of thing. You, uh, you know, you see that. I want you to go to uh, chapter 5 with me. Chapter 5, we'll just look at verse 1 here. And we're going to come back in just a minute. I'm going to give you the, uh, the outline. I'm just doing a little preliminary stuff here. But notice it says, it, verse, uh, chapter, one, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, it is reported commonly that there's fornication among you. Well, that's what the community was saying about this local church. And fornication uh, refers to all kinds of sexual immorality. And uh, so who knows what all was going on in this church. But I'll tell you something that was abominable. Look at the verse. And such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now this probably was a stepmother. And so this somebody in this church was... Uh, Involved sexually with his father's, with his uh, with his own stepmother. I don't know how else to interpret it, unless it's his own mother, which seems just too far out for me. And look at the church's attitude in verse two. And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he which hath done such a deed might be taken away from you. So you begin to see the temperature of this church. I mean, they were not only divided over everybody, divisions and factions throughout the whole assembly, but now they've got immoral, immorality going and, and, and everybody's just winking at it. They're not dealing with it. Now, I've seen a few things like that. Not, not this kind of a sin, but I've seen situations in this church to a, a minor degree, a lesser degree, but in other churches that where certain sins have been dealt with, the people, some of the people, get mad at the pastor and quit the church. Um, buddy of mine down in, um, in um, Illinois, I've preached for him many times, uh, he had a, a man in his church that was, uh, that was uh, a pedophile. Nobody knew it, but the police knew it. And they were watching him. And they caught him in the park uh, propositioning a young boy. And they arrested him. And, uh, and uh, when the pastor, of course, said, this guy's got to be voted out of our church and all that kind of stuff, he lost about a third of his members. Well, they ought to have applauded him and hugged his neck. But, you know, people are self-righteous, you know. I had a guy in this church many years ago. Uh, in fact, when this church was very early, young, I had a situation where a young girl told her aunt that her stepdad was molesting her. And, uh, of course, the mother, when she told the mother, and the mother called the sheriff and got the sheriff involved, and then they called me. Well, I was a young pastor, still in my 30s, and never experienced anything like this. And... and uh, so I called the guy at work. I said, you need to come by here and see me. So uh, he, I think he was worried because he hadn't heard the news yet. So I talked to him, and of course he had his alibi, which was, that's his business. But I, th what I did is I called about a dozen of our men, that I, key men in the church, and I had them to come to my office, and I talked to them about it and told them. And uh, would you believe about two or three of those men got mad at me and quit the church? You know, I guess you just killed a messenger, you know. I don't know. But, you know, nothing has changed. And so here, uh, here is a situation in this church at Corinth where unspeakable uh, immorality is going on and uh, the people are puffed up. 
It just doesn't seem to phase them. And in chapter 6, if you'll notice uh, in verse 1, they were going to the law with each other. They said, I'll sue you. <laughs> you know, you backed into my Mercedes. <laughs> I'll sue you. Look at what it says. Dare any of you having a matter against another go the law before the unjust and not, excuse me, not before the saints? And so what they were doing is they were taking all of their grievances and dirty laundry right to the, to the heathen judges. And uh, here they're supposed to be the members of the body of Christ and they're suing each other. And uh, look at verse 2. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you, not, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things pertaining to this life? Now, most of the things that, that are differences between God's people can be dealt with uh, by, uh, by the church. But when you have issues like I just spoke about, you have to, those are legal matters and you do have to, you have to take care of those things. You understand? It's the way I understand it anyway. And then if you go to chapter 7, now concerning the thing whereof you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and every woman have her own husband. And so, once again, there's a lot of questions going on here in these uh, chapters uh, about marriage and who should get married and all that kind of stuff and why they should get married. And uh, so that's all dealt with, the matter of uh, women uh, in church and some of the things that, uh, um, that are considered there. Um, they also talk about uh, uh, different... Uh, Meats and idols. Look at chapter 8 and verse 1. Now it's touching things uh, offered unto idols. So in this Corinthian society, there, was all, there were all kinds of idols and sacrifices. And, and uh, the meat would be sometimes put on the marketplace after they had killed the animal uh, in offering and in, in dedication to an idol. Then the meat would be sold on the marketplace. So these Christians were wondering about, uh, about eating these things. He says in verse 1, Now as touching things offered to idols, we know that we have knowledge. That is, those of us who have knowledge of God. Not everybody has that. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity or love edifieth. So he says we have knowledge about these sacrifices and about idols. We, we have this knowledge. But not everybody has it. So when he says we, he doesn't mean everybody. Uh, and uh, verse 2, he says, If any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. That is, if he doesn't uh, practice charity toward God's people in this matter. And uh, look at verse 4. As concerning therefore the eating of those things which are offered to, in sacrifice to idols, we know that is, we believers, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. So you don't ever have to be superstitious about an idol. They're nothing. They're just wood or metal or stone. They are nothing, no matter how much they've been painted and blessed and baptized. They're nothing. He says, uh, we know, again in verse 4 in the middle of it, that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. Now we know that, but not everybody knows that. In fact, not every believer has got that clear in his mind. Not only that, you get somebody saved out of society of worshiping idols, that stays with them a long time. I've had people come into this church, and they were saved, and they said, when we came in, the first thing, you know, I wanted to kneel at the end of the, of the pew and make the sign of the cross. I've had folks to tell me that. And, uh, you know, when you've had it in your life, all your life, from an infant, that, and to reverence and fear idols and all these things, just getting saved doesn't wipe that out of your brain. It takes time. So he says, we know that an idol is nothing, that is, those of, with some maturity, and that there is none other God but one. Now look at verse 5. 
For though there be that are called gods, such as you have in India and Hinduism and all these others, uh, whether in heaven or earth, uh, as there be gods many, that's false gods, and lords many, verse 6, but unto us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Look at verse 7. Howbeit, there is not in every man that knowledge. So what he's saying then, that you need to be considered of other people, other believers. I mean, you're mature, and you've got all this understanding, and you know that an idol is nothing, and you could tie a rope around, <laughs> around its neck and drag it down through Linwood, and it wouldn't bother you a bit. It'd bother somebody. You understand? It'd bother somebody. I remember one time, <laughs> I wouldn't do it anymore, but uh, one time I was preaching on something just like this, and I had a statue of Mary right here. And about halfway through my sermon, I broke her head off. I just took a, you know, you know. Now, I haven't changed my mind about the idols, but I have changed my mind, my approach a little bit, I hope. You see. Well, you know, what you've got to do is be considerate in these matters that there's not in every man that knowledge. That's even a Christian. Now, you may think, oh, no, yes, even a Christian. Um, you know, I've led guys to the Lord, and it took forever. I don't know if I ever did yet. To get, he told me, he said, I come, to Sunday, I come to church, and I get the Bible, and then I go to the University of Washington, and I get Marxism. <laughs> you know, and he was battling between that. And then uh, he'd been taught uh, evolution. And the guy's as saved as you and me, but, you know, he believed he'd been taught evolution. And a lot of people can't get that out of their brain. Or they struggle with it, you see. So you've got to get over this idea that a man or a woman can't be saved if they have all this baggage. Yes, they can, but it takes time to get them out of it. And that's where discipleship and training and, and time comes in. You know, some folks, they don't have any patience. They want everybody as mature as they are, fully sanctified, this moment they get saved, it doesn't work that way. It takes years sometimes, depending on, on their background and how much education and all that, where they came from. So Paul is saying then, uh, there's not in every man that knowledge for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered to an idol and their conscience being weak as defiles. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. So in this church then, the, you can see the division was not, over pers not only over personalities, it was over the matters of immoralities, it was over the matter of, of uh, marriages and over the matter of of what to eat and not to eat and sacrifices and idols, all these things were, 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 being, were problems. They were, also, uh, they were also battling this matter of the resurrection. Go to chapter 15 with me. And uh, um, look at, uh, well, let's see. Um, look at verse 12, 15, 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you, that's within this church, that there is no resurrection of the dead. Now what does a man or a woman have to fully understand about the resurrection? Now certainly he has to believe that Christ arose but he can have all kinds of other views about the, about the resurrection of the saints and, uh, and things of that nature. They don't have to have the same view. I wish everybody agreed with me, but um, there's not in everybody that knowledge. Okay. I say that with tongue in cheek. I hope you know. He says in verse 13, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? 
And if Christ be not risen, our preaching is vain, and your faith is vain, and we're found false witnesses, and so on, you're yet in your sins. So there is an imperative here. And the imperative is that Jesus Christ must have raised from the dead. He, had to, he has to be alive, because a dead Savior can't save you. And so that, and then in chapter 16, there's this matter about the offering. Look at chapter 16 and verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints... As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do you. And of course, uh, Paul is, is uh, ultimately criticized even because of this. So the purpose of the writing then is that bad news had arrived uh, concerning the Corinthian church that came to Paul while he was at Ephesus. And so he sets down to uh, address these problems and so the reason, the purpose for the writing is to correct the sinful practices and refute false doctrine. So if you're writing anything down that's as a purpose, that's what you'd want to write down, to correct uh, sinful practices and refute false doctrines. And uh, we're going to, I'm going to try to give you an outline here of the book and uh, maybe it'll help you. And the, I would say the key verse here would be chapter 1 verse, 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same things, and that there be no division among you, and that you perfectly, uh, uh, that you be perfectly joined together in the name, in, in the same mind, and in the same judgment. Now really, that is really the key to a church's survival. A church must have correct doctrine, sound doctrine, and then God's people must love each other and work at maintaining the unity. If they will do those two things, the devil cannot get his foot in the door. If they'll do those two things, if they'll work at loving each other and maintaining harmony and unity, and they work at it, endeavoring to keep the unity of the saints, and also to make sure that sound doctrine is taught, there's nothing else needed. Everything else will take care of itself. But when one of those is missing, then the church is uh, in, in serious trouble because false doctrine leads to false living. And then that leads to all kinds of problems. And uh, in almost all of Paul's writing, especially in his doctrinal epistles, the doctrine will always be first and then the practical will follow. And uh, so that uh, verse 10 is what I would call the key uh, to the book. Now in chapter 1, verse 1 through 9, you have the introduction to the book as Paul gives the introduction. And then Roman number 1, you have the problems reported by the house of Clo. And that's in chapter 1, verse 10, all the way through chapter 6, verse 20. Clo, C-H-L-O-E. And uh, you read about him there in verse 10, or verse 11, really. It hath been declared by them which are at the house of Clo that there be contentions among you. And so, first of all, you have the factions in the church. I mentioned that. That's in uh, chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 4, verse 21. And uh, so these... Uh, these uh, Battles uh, are going on. These people are puffed up uh, with pride. Um, notice verse 20 of chapter 1. Where is the wise? Now where is the scribe? Where is the disputer in this world? So the disputing was going on within the church because you had this segment that felt that they were, you know, they were just a notch above the others. And uh, they were arguing about words and about doctrines and things of this nature. Uh, and uh, he said, where, where, where is the wise? Verse 20. He says, hath not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? Now that's an interesting thing. What is foolish? Well, the preaching of the gospel. To the world, that is foolishness. And uh, look at verse 20. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. You ought to underline that statement right there. The world by wisdom knew not God. 
the world by wisdom knew not God. That's the worldly wisdom. Remember when the devil said to Adam and Eve, your eyes will be open and you will be as gods? Well, they got their eyes open. And uh, so that's what's been going on. And so the devil is telling mankind, it's the same old lie, that you are a god. That you're your own god. And that is a prevailing philosophy. Um, verse 22, for the Jews require a sign. Now that's important when you get over to the chapters on the tongues over there in about chapter 11, 12, and 13, or 12, 13, and 14. And if I deal with this book all the way through, I will certainly deal with that. But it is important in verse 22, it says, the Jews require a sign. That's why they kept asking for signs constantly. They're a sign-seeking people. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. But, verse 23, we preach Christ crucified unto the Jew is a stumbling block. In other words, we preach that the Messiah, we preach that the Messiah uh, was um, going to have to die on the cross to pay for men's sins. And to the Jew, he stumbles over that. He cannot, uh, it, it offends him. But to the Greek, the intellectual crowd, it's foolishness. They scoff at it. And so he says, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jew a stumbling block and unto the Greek foolishness. But look at verse 24. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, uh, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So when a believer understands all that he has in Christ, he realizes that Jesus Christ is his power and his wisdom. Christ is our wisdom. And he's our power. And that's why the Bible says to set your affection on things above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Christ is the wisdom of God. And um, look at verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. I was uh, talking to somebody the other night, not here at the church, but somewhere else, and he was talking about uh, a, a buddy of his, or not a buddy, but a, but a, but a friend, uh, whatever. And he was talking about how, just how thick this guy is. He said, I can't get through to him. The guy dumber than a rock. And I said, well, I said, do you think it, there's... Do you think the gap between you and him is as great as the gap between God and you? He said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> and so when you begin to compare um, yourself, your wisdom with God, it's like foolishness. God's foolishness is smarter than you or me. But there is no foolishness with God. But you understand how Paul is using the words here because, verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Well, Christ died in weakness, but he arose triumphant. And uh, God hath chosen the foolish things. Look at verse 26. This, is quite a, this ought to get their attention, kind of a slap upside the head. He says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, and not many noble are called. He says, look around in your church and see how many, you know, uh, intelligent, uh, brilliant people you've got. But verse 27, God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are. Why? Verse 20, 29. That no flesh would glory in his presence. You see. I said to Brother Ruckman one time, I said, how do you get wisdom? He smirked a little bit and said, I guess just plead ignorance. And you know that's really the best thing you can do? If in your own mind you'll just remain ignorant, you can learn something. But when you get the idea that, uh, that you know it, uh, you usually can't be taught anything. And so the best thing to do is just take the attitude, I'm a child, I don't know anything. And uh, I'm weak. 
And if you don't teach me, I'll remain ignorant. And if you don't help me, I'll remain weak. I, you know, I can't do anything. And uh, that's the attitude you need to come to God. That's the way you need to go. And I don't care what kind of degree you got. It doesn't make any difference. You still have got a long ways to go, and God can help you all the way if you'll, if you'll let him. Now, I like verse 30. This is such a wonderful, wonderful verse. Sums it up. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us. In other words, those of you that are in Christ Jesus, here's what God has made him for you. He has made our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. He's everything. He's everything. And he's all you need. That song we sang, all I need, all I need, Christ is all I need. I think there is a song that has these words in it, isn't, isn't there? Yeah. Verse 31, why is all of that? That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. What were they doing? They were glorying in personalities and people. And they were holding preachers in, in, in high esteem and, and teachers and all of this. And you shouldn't do that. Learn from people all you can. But realize they're just flesh. All, every man is flesh. It's like grass. You know, I was talking about our lawn to Doug a while ago. I said, boy, this lawn out here really looks nice and green. And, uh, but you know, if you don't take care of it in, in a week, it'll be brown and dead. That's the way grass is. That's kind of the way we are. In chapter 5, I spent a little more time there than I should have. Uh, in chapter 5, uh, you have the sexual immorality. That's point 2 under Roman number 1. And then in chapter 6, uh, third point here is you have lawsuits among the brethren. And then in, also in chapter 6, that's in verse, uh, verses 1 through 11, lawsuits among the brethren. The sexual immorality is in chapter 5, verse 1 through 13. And I mentioned the factions in the church. Uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 1 through 4, through verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 21. And then in, last of all into that, you have the moral uh, def, uh, defilements in chapter 6 and uh, down about verse, uh, verse 12. Verse 12. And he goes on to talk about those things. And uh, in verse 18 he says, Flee fornication, for every sin that a man doth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Verse 19, What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? Verse 20, For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are His. So Paul is writing to them. This is a corrective letter and trying to do that. Now, Roman numeral 2. Here are problems mentioned in the letter from Corinth. Um, and uh, in, uh, that's through ch chapter 7, 1 through 16, 9. And uh, in, uh, the first thought under that is marriage and celibacy. And that's in chapter 7, all, all the way through all, the, all 40 verses here. And uh, I don't really have time to deal with that, but he's talking about the matter of marriage and remarriage and who should get married and why and all of that. Um, so you might want to take time, and if we get a chance we go through this book, I will deal with that chapter in detail. In chapter 8, verse 1, through chapter 11, verse 1, you have the matter of eating meats and sacrifices to idols. In chapter 11, verses 2 through 16, you have the matter of women praying and prophesying with their heads uncovered, which is something that we'll definitely deal with when we get there. Chapter 11, uh, you, have, uh, you have the Lord's Supper. I want you to turn there, chapter 11. And uh, uh, let's see, chapter 11, look about, down about verse uh, 17. Notice these, these folks aren't doing a bit better as we get toward the end of the book. Now in this, thing, in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, 
that you come together not for the better but for the worse. So these people, when they came together for the communion service, it'd be better they didn't do it at all. Because he says, when you come together, it's not for the better but for the worse. Verse 18, For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be what? Divisions among you. <laughs> so the divisions have lasted from verse 1 all the way through, obviously. And it's really showing itself in the matter of the Lord's Supper, which should be probably one of the most spiritual uh, times of the service. And, uh, and, and, it, and their division and carnality is more evident there than probably anywhere else. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's evident. So that's what he talks about in chapter 11, 17 through 34. And um, he talks about, I mean, these folks were literally getting drunk they were literally getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. That's kind of wild, isn't it? Look at verse 22. What? Have you not houses to eat and drink in, or despise you the church of God, and shame them which have not? And um, so he goes on and he talks about that, and uh, how they should take care of themselves. Okay? Look at verse 34. And if a man is hungry, let him eat at home, that you may not come together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when we come. And then next, you, it talks about spiritual gifts in chapter 12, all the way through chapter 14, verse 40, this whole section. Now, not by any stretch of the imagination does this church all of a sudden get spiritual in this portion of this book. I mean, they're just as messed up on the spiritual gifts as they are on everything else. You don't all of a sudden have a real spiritual section here, as some people think. This is not a doctrinal matter. This is a corrective letter. So we'll talk about that. In chapter 15, verse 1 through 58, uh, you deal with the matter of the resurrection of the dead. And then, again, in chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, you have the collection of the saints. And then in verses, uh, same chapter, verse 5 through 24, Paul gives his concluding remarks and instruction and benediction. All right, let me just ask you a couple of questions, see if you were listening. Um, where do we read of the establishing of this church? What? Acts 18, that's right. Okay. What two people did Paul first... Well, I didn't deal with that. Uh, approximately how long did Paul stay at Corinth? Quickly. A year and six months. A year and a half, that's right. Okay. Uh, what kind of work did they do? Well, they were tent makers. That's right. Okay. From where did Paul write the letter? That's exactly right. Okay. What's the approximate date? That's exactly right. You got that one right. And um, what two uh, things existed in Corinth that uh, appeared to have an adverse effect on the church? Two things. Give me a word. What? No. No. Okay, immorality and intellectualism. Okay, I don't remember if I mentioned those two together like that, but, but that, is, uh, that was uh, what was going on. Intellectualism and immorality. Okay, and, la and let's see. What is the purpose of this epistle? That's right. All right. And what did we say is the key verse or where is the theme of this epistle stated? One what? One ten. one ten. I thought I heard somebody say one eight. I was going to say F for you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, I think what we'll do, Lord willing, we'll uh, we may just uh, you know uh, start in with this book and deal with with it, and uh, we'll just leave the ends open so that you know if I get uh, something I want to really scold you about, I can. I can break off and do that, okay? All right. 
Let's uh, stand together and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you again for your mercy to us. I pray you'll bless these uh, thoughts uh, that have been uh, uh, shared with these folks tonight. I pray, Lord, that you'll uh, help us to be better Christians and to understand what is acceptable and what is not and how we ought to behave in the house of God. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. All right, be sure and shake hands with someone. Good night. God bless you.